Welcome to Christchurch Sidcup's Good Friday service of meditation. My name's Tom Parsons, I'm the vicar at Christchurch, and this afternoon we're going to be following John's account of Jesus' death. We'll be reading it through, I'll be leading some thoughts on it, and there'll be musical interludes, opportunities to be quiet, to reflect, to pray. As we start our time together, let me lead us in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us on the cross. Lead us, we pray now, in the Spirit, to that glorious event, that our hearts may draw strength from it, encouragement and salvation itself. Looking to Jesus, may we know his peace, his freedom, and even on this dark remembrance, May we know his joy, for we ask it in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. The immovable declaration. Jesus is required to carry his own cross to the execution site. Its Aramaic name is Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull, although we've come to know it through its Latin name as Calvary. This ghastly hill became the stage on which God glorified the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. John selects snapshots that point to the true meaning of this event. And first, we must pay close attention to the sign that Pilate had fastened to the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Pilate deliberately worded this notice of the charge against Jesus to offend the Jewish authorities. He's showing exactly what he thinks of these leaders. He's saying to them, this pitiful man is exactly the sort of king you deserve. <laughs> I imagine he took pleasure in their fury. How Pilate humiliated them. The Passover pilgrims might pass the prominent location and think the Jewish leaders had actually endorsed Jesus. So the Jewish leaders insist on a vital change of wording. Jesus claimed to be a king. That would make it clear that they rejected the claim. But Pilate is in no mood to spare their blushes. Now, when it costs him nothing, he digs his heels in and insists that the placard will stand immovable. Or is it God who's refusing to budge? The father is putting his own words into his enemies' unwitting mouths, or to be more precise, their signage. God is using that sign to broadcast the truth. Jesus is the king of the Jews, and he reigns, even as he hangs on the cross. The sign, it transforms this shameful instrument into a throne. And there's more evidence that God is using this sign it is written in three languages, indicating that Jesus is not only the king of the Jews, but rules all nations. Pilate and the chief priests, they both despise Jesus, but God the Father is not ashamed of him. He has deliberately lifted his son onto a throne the world despises to pour scorn on the world's glory and to establish his immovable kingdom that will have the last word. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for enthroning Jesus. May we never be ashamed of the cross, but see it as your glory. May the power of the Holy Spirit, may the world be crucified to us and us to the world, that we may live to his kingdom alone. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. The gambling executioners. All four Gospels mention them. Gambling executioners playing at the foot of the cross for possession of Jesus' undergarment. John gives more information about this incident than Matthew, Mark or Luke. What significance does he see in it? On one level, it demonstrates human indifference in all its callousness. On a purely human level, how hard these men must have been to think of gaining from the crucified victim before his own eyes. They're concerned about the material question only. The morality of stealing from a dying man doesn't concern them at all. Here is the pitiless selfishness that characterises all the atrocities of human history. At a deeper level, the game over the clothes illustrates Jesus' self-offering in all its completeness. Most paintings of Jesus on the cross preserve his modesty, but the soldiers don't care about that. They took his undergarment and left him naked. When Adam and Eve turned away from God, nakedness became an outward expression of their inward guilt and shame. And on the cross, Jesus takes that guilt and shame upon himself, and so he also assumes our nakedness to him in order to clothe us with his own perfect qualities. But on the deepest level, this incident exhibits God's sovereignty in all its power. John quotes Psalm 22, a song King David wrote a thousand years before Jesus' death. The psalm describes the suffering of God's Messiah in precise detail before prophesying his victory. It mentions the very game John witnessed those soldiers playing. So why did they play the game? The word so leads us to the ultimate reason. The scripture had to be fulfilled, so this is what the soldiers did. God's word stated that they would do this, and so they did. His sovereign purpose is irresistibly at work. I remember my amazement when I first discovered the links between Psalm 22 and Jesus' death. It boosted my confidence that the cross really was at the center of God's purposes. If you've never read that psalm, read it today. The gambling executioners unwittingly confirm God's faithfulness. That is, confirms it to everybody who sees their actions through the lenses of Scripture. Their selfishness highlights Jesus' infinite love. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you that your sovereign plan was irresistibly working out through Jesus' death. Lord Jesus, thank you for offering yourself for us so completely. Holy Spirit, help us to overcome our callous indifference and clothe us with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Our church, is it an accident? Pain seems to intensify our awareness of ourselves and to accentuate the irritation we feel towards others. Jesus must have been tempted to respond to his own agonies in a self-centered way too. But instead, he kept looking outwards towards the needs of others. Jesus' outward focus is demonstrated in a moving incident that John must have treasured. This disciple stands near the cross along with a group of women, which includes Jesus' mother, Mary. Seeing them both there bereft, Jesus gives Mary and John to one another as mother and son. It's hard to imagine Mary's pain as she watched her firstborn son on the cross. We must assume that her husband, Joseph, had died. That's why Jesus was so concerned that she should have a home to go to. He provided the best comfort he could. A new son, John, the dear friend who was known as the disciple Jesus loved. This is a unique and intimate moment, but it reveals a love every believer is invited to experience. It represents in miniature what Jesus aimed to accomplish for us all. He died to form a new family, also known as the church. Jesus died to establish a new relationship between God and each one of us as individuals. But he also intended to form relationships among all who trust in him. The new connection between Mary and John is just one of billions he created by his death. Did it occur to you that Jesus carefully and lovingly appointed our connections with the others in our church? He formed these relationships from the cross. Perhaps we thought we were just thrown together by accident after the morning service for coffee. Jesus understands and loves you as well as he did John and Mary. In his death, he assigned to you brothers and sisters, mothers and children that are perfect for you and you are perfect for them. Now, we might think that can't be true. But if we commit to one another in our church family, convinced that Jesus has drawn us together at such great cost, we will discover that he has provided for us as thoughtfully as he did for his mother and his friend, John. We pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus drew us into fellowship with others through his sacrifice of himself. Open our eyes to recognize fellow believers, the ones we know, as your gift to us in the spirit and by the power of Jesus' offering. Amen. Later, 
knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I thirst. Jesus promised that those who trust in him will never go thirsty. How striking it is then that he should gasp out from the cross, I thirst. Jesus' thirst hints at the intensity of the physical horrors he endured as the fluids drained from his body on that stifling afternoon. And it is likely that John also intends us to detect spiritual significance in his thirst. John states that there were two reasons why Jesus said, I thirst. First, he knew that all was now completed. His work is done. But he was not content only to know that for himself. He wanted to be able to announce it for our benefit. Yet, how could he do so with a parched mouth? It seems that by asking for a drink, he was preparing himself to utter the words we will consider later. It is finished. But then second, Jesus said, I thirst in order that the scripture would be fulfilled. He seems to be referring to two Psalms, Numbers 22 and 69. His tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth, Psalm 22, but he is given only vinegar for his thirst, Psalm 69. Both Psalms describe the suffering of God's anointed king and they point beyond the suffering towards the salvation that will follow as God vindicates him. So Jesus is intentionally identifying himself as this suffering king and he is pointing to his future triumph. So these two reasons account for why Jesus said the word, I thirst, but why did he enter the state of thirst at all? He has promised to give in living water to us because we sinners are separated from God and we are in a state of thirst. Spiritually, we are parched and we will thirst to death. The only way for us to receive the water living water was for the anointed king to experience our spiritual dehydration for us and Jesus has done it. On the cross he experienced our thirst in all its agony to take it from us and in completing that loving work he has opened a supply of refreshment that will never run dry. So let us ask now for that refreshment. Father God, we come to Jesus who said that he who believes in me will never go thirsty. Thank you that he bore our spiritual thirst so that we may have living water through the Holy Spirit. Fill our emptiness, refresh our weariness, satisfy our restless hearts to the praise of all he accomplished on his cross. Amen.
A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Done. A sip of wine vinegar gave Jesus enough voice to declare for our benefit what he already knew to be true. It is finished. What is finished? Jesus' prayer back in chapter 17 of John's Gospel provides clear answers. Jesus has completed the work the Father gave him to do. He has glorified the Father. He has gained eternal life to those, all, for all those who the Father has given him. All is done. Other themes and phrases from John's Gospel comes to mind. Love is fully expressed. The cup of God's wrath is drained. Satan is driven out and the world is overcome. All this is done, irreversibly and forever done. Other belief systems require us to do things if we are to gain salvation in whatever way they may define salvation. So they say, learn this, sacrifice that, pay the other. This approach leads to a cycle of fear and slog and resentment and guilt. Committed Christians sometimes slip back into it. So what a relief there is in Jesus' triumphant declaration. It is finished. He has accomplished our salvation in full and gives it to us as a gift. We don't need to do things to achieve God's acceptance. We trust that Jesus has done it all. And there's instant proof that he has. As soon as he uttered the victory cry, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now death forcefully takes our lives because we sin. Jesus freely gives his life because he has no sin. But he does, doesn't he? What about our sin that he was carrying? Why did he not die and have death forced upon him for that? Because he had borne our judgment in those hours on the cross, our conviction had already been fully spent. And at the moment of death, Jesus is offering his perfect work to the Father freely. And he is offering it on our behalf as us. So God the Father's welcome is not a distant goal we hope to reach one day. It's our privilege from the very outset of the Christian life from the moment we trust in Jesus. And it is our joy all along the way. If our consciences condemn us, return to these impregnable words. It is finished. Lord Jesus, we thank you for declaring your work to be done in this great victory cry. Have mercy upon us and overcome all our fears as this glorious phrase rings in our ears and in our hearts that you have done it. Father, we pray this in Jesus' glorious name. Amen.
Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Calvary's appeal. John is still standing near the cross when the soldiers arrive with Pilate's permission to kill off the crucified victims. They are acting on the wishes of the Jewish authorities who want the bodies removed as soon as possible so the ugly scene doesn't cast a shadow over the Passover celebrations. Breaking the victims' legs, that was the most efficient way of speeding death. With no lower body support, the victims would quickly suffocate under the weight of their own chests. The soldiers perform the brutal efficiency on the two men executed with Jesus, but they reckon he has already died, and a spear thrust confirms it as blood and water flow from his side. Modern medicine can explain why this separation of fluids confirms death. The soldiers only knew from experience that it meant the victim was really dead. That's an important fact to establish. It means that the resurrection cannot be written off merely as a remarkable recovery because Jesus really was dead. But God is still at work. John realised that he was fulfilling scriptures through Jesus, even in these gruesome post-mortem procedures. So first, God preserved Jesus' bones to identify him as the persecuted but finally triumphant figure referred to in Psalm 34. Not one of his bones will be broken. Rather, says the psalm, God protects, redeems and exonerates him. Through the unbroken bones, God is telling us that Jesus' story is not over. And then in fulfilment of one of the most startling of prophecies, Jesus' side is pierced. Speaking through the prophet Zechariah, God tells the people of Jerusalem that one day they will pierce him. Yes, they will thrust through the living God. And yet on that very day, a fountain will be opened to the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Christians have often identified this cleansing fountain with the blood and water that flowed from Jesus' side. John testified that he saw these events, which confirmed the testimony of the Old Testament. God appeals to us to them through, through the lengthening shadows of sordid Calvary. Believe, he urges us, trust my beloved son and receive eternal life from his historic death. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for your testimony about your son. Apply his cleansing blood to our lives that by the power of the same eternal spirit through whom he offered himself, we may turn from sin and worship you with all our soul, heart, mind and might. In Jesus' name, Amen.
we are living in strange times. Aware of one another, of the fears that are around us and perhaps within, we commit one another now in prayer as we close to our loving Heavenly Father. On this Good Friday, we come to you, Father God, asking for the peace that flows from the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, to fill our hearts now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us this day and always. Amen.